The truth is, when one domino falls, another one falls, and another one, and another one, and if you set up hundreds of them, then the dominoes just keep on falling and falling. And so it is in the life of Abraham. A domino fell, and that had a cause, an effect, and just one event happened after another. We use the term things spiral out of control. That's what was happening with, particularly Abraham's Lot nephew, um, his, his nephew Lot. Each of us make decisions, and on the basis of, of our decisions, something happens, and that has another cause, and that has another cause, and another cause, just like the dominoes falling. So Abraham and his family are making decisions that have a domino effect on their lives. Have we got the PowerPoint? Oh, you're not working on it. Yeah, not quite. Working on it, okay. As I studied this passage in Genesis 14, I got really stuck, I got really in a, in a, in a muddle about who was who, particularly in the opening verses. Do you know how I sorted it? I used a very sophisticated piece of equipment. Do you want to tell me what this sophisticated piece of equipment is? Shall I tell you? Eh? It was a notebook and a pen. And I wrote down the, the four northern kings, and then I wrote down the five southern kings, and then I found a Bible map and looked at them, and guess what? I understood what was happening. I, I commend these pieces of technology to you folks. Immensely helpful. Immensely helpful. So, are we still working on it? Yeah. Marvellous. Okay. In verse 1, at the beginning of Genesis 14, we see a set of northern kings. These kings lived in what we now know as Turkey and Iraq and Iran, that are north of the land of Canaan and northeast of Canaan, which we now know as Israel. The four kings, they are the schoolyard bullies. These four kings from the north are the four bullies. We have Kedileoma, king of Elam. He seems to be the leader. And then we've got his friends, Amroth, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Alesar, and Tidal, king of Goyim. These four northern kings, these bullies, are at war with five southern kings. Switch off. Yeah. Switch off. Doesn't yeah, yeah, matter. Yeah. Not a problem. We see these five southern kings. These five kings are, they're the little guys. They're the ones that are always picked on in the schoolyard by the big bullies. They seem to be kings of just one particular city instead of a nation. So we have Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shin Shinab, king of Adma, Shemembe, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela. So the five northern bully kings came down with their armies and they put these five little guy kings under their rule. They made the imposed Heavy, imposed heavy payment on them that lasted for, for 12 years. But in the 13th year, these southern kings rebelled against their northern oppressors. Now, while the northern kings were fighting against the Amalekites and Amorites, the five southern kings decided that while their attention was being diverted, they would try and rebel and they would take advantage and they would go into battle themselves. So out they marched, feeling strong and confident together. Five little kings against these big four bully kings from the north. And they fought together in the Valley of Sidim, which is at the southern end of the, the, the Dead Sea. Unfortunately, the four bullies from the north won yet again. Some of the southern kings fell into the tar pits, while others fled into the mountains on either side of the Dead Sea. So the conquering four kings... They'd not only won the battle, but they then ransacked the neighbouring cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. They took all the loot, all the good stuff away with them, and they captured a whole load of people, and one of the people that they captured was Lot. Because Lot had made a bad decision. He, as we heard in the kids' story, as we heard in two weeks ago when Tim... The gun preached on Genesis 13. Lot saw the green lush pastures for his sheep 
And he thought, yes, that's where I want to go. And he thought he would be safe living next to the wicked city of, of Sodom. But he wasn't. He made a bad choice and the dominoes started to fall. He went near the city of Sodom and he, he went close to the city of Sodom and we'll find out before too long, he was living in the wicked city of Sodom. One bad choice after another. And that, his choices back in Genesis 13, the effect was that poor old Lot got captured by these four bully kings. As the four conquering kings made their way back up north, going home, they no doubt felt very pleased and smug with themselves. Another great victory. Look at all the stuff we've captured. Fantastic. They'd won battles against lots of smaller tribes in the area. They'd once more put the rebellious five southern kings under their control. And to cap it off, they'd plundered Sodom and Gomorrah, taken all the spoils of war with them. And so... The hero of our story enters, Abraham. Abraham was living near the trees of Mamre and he'd made an alliance with the man called Mamre and his two brothers, Eshcol and Anna. Abraham is ticked off by one of the men who've escaped, that Lot's been captured. So when he hears the bad news about Lot's captivity, Abraham sets about mobilizing his trained forces all 318 of them to go and catch, to go and release Lot. His friends Mamre and the brothers come with him. So Abram sets off 120 miles north to where these four kings are now resting. By means of a surprise attack at night, he defeats the invaders, he chases them another hundred miles north, seeing them right out of the land. He rescues Lot and his possessions and all the goods and people that have been captured from Sodom. It's an amazing victory, completely overshadowing the victories that, that the four kings from the north have made. Abraham and his forces defeat the four bully northern kings who'd reigned in terror over the entire region. This man of God at last has brought stability to the entire region. This is a partial fulfillment of Genesis 12 verse 3 where God said, I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. Well, the northern kings had, had cursed Abraham's family by capturing Lot. So the Lord cursed them in defeat. The Lord keeps his promises. So Abraham recovered all the goods and all the people, including his nephew Lot. I trust you notice that Abraham responded straight away to Lot's cry for help. There was no kind of, well, it serves you right. If you hadn't lived beside that wicked city, you wouldn't have been captured. It's your fault, Lot. You sorted out yourself. You got yourself into it, this mess. You sorted out. Abraham didn't take that attitude at all. It's wonderful when believers stand together through the tough times. The Bible says that the way you and I respond to each other's tough times is a reflection of our, your relationship with them but also your relationship with the Lord Jesus. Do you know that you ex the Bible says that you express your love for Christ as you sh visibly show love for one another. In John's first letter, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, it reads, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God, but... Whoever does not love, does not love God, because God is love. And again, in James chapter 2, we read, What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but no deeds? If a man claims to have faith but no deeds, can, can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes or daily food. If one of you says, to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs. What good is that? Both of these readings from 1 John 4 
and James 2 are saying that you and I prove the genuineness of our love for Christ as it's outworked in our love for one another. If we fail to show a clear and tangible love, a visible love, if we fail to show that, then you may be denying that you love the Lord Jesus. According to the Bible, God demonstrated his love in sending his one and only son to the cross. We need to demonstrate our love for one another. And it needs to be real, it needs to be clear, and it needs to be visible. As he was getting near home, travelling back down south, as Abraham was getting near home, he met two kings. He met Bera, king of Sodom, and he met Melchizedek, king of Salem. Let's start with what happens when he meets Bera, king of Sodom. Don't forget, he was king over an evil city. The king of Sodom said to Abraham in verse 21, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. Now, King Beryl was clearly grateful to Abraham for saving his life and rescuing his people. So he wanted to give Abraham a gift. What, what could be possibly wrong with, with that? But Abraham had rehearsed his answer. He thought this might happen. So he rehearsed his answer. He already decided what to say if such a thing would happen. He said in verse 22 of chapter 14, I have raised my hand to the Lord God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and I've taken an oath, an oath that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the thong of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abraham rich. King Berah was offering Abraham great riches and Abraham said, no, I don't want a piece of it. Not even one of your shoelaces. Not a bit. And the, the, the expression on, on the king's face would have been priceless. People don't do that, do they? People don't refuse anything for, for free. But nothing was going to take the glory away from God in Abraham's eyes. If Abraham was rich in this life, then and he was, then he wanted everybody to know it was God who had made him rich, not a wicked king from a wicked city. Back in Genesis 12 verse 2, God said, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you, said God. And God was doing that. So therefore, Abraham wasn't going to take any riches from anybody else. God was going to give him all the riches God will get all the praise and glory. And that's the right way, isn't it? The right way. Abraham knows that everything in this world belongs to God. Every, Abraham knows that everything in his home, everything in his fields, it all belongs to God. So all the praise is going to go to him. No one will be able to say that the evil king bearer made him rich. He's not going to take a penny of profit Though he's, he's happy for his men to receive riches from Bera, he says, no, you, you, give it to the guys. I don't want it. Give it, give, it to, give it to anybody you like. I don't mind, but I don't want it. He'd not take a penny's worth of profit for himself. But when he's happy for his men to take it, he knows that he can't expect ungodly people to live by God's standards. Are, are, are you like that? Or are you determined that God will receive all the praise and glory for, for the things that you do in his name? When you do works of service for the Lord, when you serve one another, when you serve the church, when you serve your family, when you serve your work colleagues, are you, are you, are you looking for praise and affirmation? Or are you happy that it's been seen by an audience of one? Are you happy with that? That, that takes real maturity. I'm still waiting for the day myself. But it takes great maturity to serve God, knowing that an audience of one has seen it, and that's enough because he's, his smile is enough. And so this mysterious figure, 
Melchizedek appears. We don't know much about him other than he just seems to appear out of nowhere. But Abraham's response to him is great. He was the king of Salem. And that probably means what we now know as Jerusalem. Probably the king of Jerusalem. Now the word Salem means peace. So he is the king of peace. His name, Melchizedek, means righteousness. So he's the king of peace and he's the king of righteousness. Does that ring any bells? Can you think of another king of peace and another king of righteousness? Abraham recognizes this king before him is much greater than he is because Melchizedek was a priest of El Elyon, the God Most High. Abraham recognized that he was in the presence of greatness, not because he was a king, but because he was a priest of Almighty God. Let's pause for a moment and consider this Melchizedek. He was a priest and he was a king. Now that was very unusual for one man to be priest and king. Actually, there was a time in the Old Testament when one of the kings, Uzziah, tried to, to fulfill the, 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 the function of a, a priest and the Lord struck him down with leprosy as a punishment. You must not be, if you're a king, you must not be a priest. Because by that time, the priesthood must only come from, from the, the tribe of, of, of Levi. You must not be a king and a priest. But it was okay for Melchizedek. It was okay for him. The Old Testament priests were called Levites. They came from the family line of Aaron and his brother Moses. But there would come a time when these Levitical priests would not be needed anymore. There's come a time today when the Levitical priests are not needed anymore. We read in Psalm 110 verse 4, You were a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. David wrote that. And David is prophesying that one day a king will come who will be a priest greater than the Levitical priests. And that was Jesus. A priest in the order of Melchizedek. The Old Testament law had been given to Moses, but it was imperfect. Nobody could keep that Old Testament law except the Son of God. And so once he died on the cross, he fulfilled the Old Testament law and therefore it was closed. It was fulfilled and not necessary for us to fulfill it. Jesus has completed all of the Old Testament law so that we don't have to. That's a marvellous release of a burden from us, folks. It's marvellous. There's, there's no record in the Bible of Melchizedek's ancestry, nor is there any record of his death. That implies that he is an eternal priest like Jesus. He's serving as a priest and a king today as Jesus is. Jesus is the great high priest. He lives forever. He is forever at the Father's right hand. And what Jesus is doing the work of a priest. What is that? What's the work of a priest? The work of the priest is to represent God to the people and to represent the people to God. Well, that's what Jesus is doing. He's interceding for us, the book of Hebrews tells us. Jesus is interceding for us. Now, see, so he's representing us to God and God to to us as he intercedes. He's fulfilling the great high priest function even today, even right now. He's praying for you and me, folks. Jesus is praying right now for me and you. This is the kind of priest that we need. Somebody who, who will pray for us every day because we need God's help every day. We need God's forgiveness every day, don't we? And so it's generally accepted that this Melchizedek is a forerunner of Christ. It's not Christ, but he's a type of Christ. He's a type of Christ to give us a picture of what the real Messiah would be like. He's a type of Christ. And then in verse 19 of Genesis 14, we read that Melchizedek blessed Abraham. Blessed be Abraham by God most high, creator of heaven and earth, Melchizedek said. You know, King Bera from Sodom, he tried to give Abraham some pretty good stuff, lots of riches. 
But he couldn't give what Melchizedek offered. He couldn't give God's blessing. He couldn't give God's blessing. And that is what Abraham craved much more than earthly riches. And what was Abraham's spontaneous response to the, the blessing of this great king Melchizedek? He gave him a tenth of everything that he had. Verse 20, simply, then Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. Instantly, spontaneous, <coughs> out of a grateful heart. He was no, under no compulsion to do that, but he wanted to do that out of a grateful heart. It was his natural response. Melchizedek blessed him with God's blessing, and so Abraham blessed Melchizedek with the tenth of all he had. Abraham gave out a grateful heart because of the blessings he received from Melchizedek. And that should be our response today. To give out of a grateful heart to the God who loves us and gave his son to die for us. Do you know that joy? Do you know that, that, that joy of giving the first portion of your money to the Lord? Not, not the little dregs that's left over. Not, not a couple of odd pieces left down that you find down the back of a settee. But the first portion of your money. The first portion of your money. Do you know the joy of giving that to the work of the Lord? I was thrilled a couple of weeks ago. We, we, we send a, um, a, a, a prayer list round church every two weeks. We'll call it e-pray because it goes by e-mail. And I was thrilled a couple of weeks ago when somebody in the fellowship gave thanks for an anonymous donation that they'd received from somebody in the church family. You know, our church, like every church in the land, we have people who go through hard times every now and again. So it's wonderful when people in the church family step up and help one another out. Because you know what? That's what families do. That's what families do. If, my, if, if your brother, your sister, your child, your parents is going for a hard time, you wouldn't think twice about helping them financially, whether you can afford it or not. And if we are really a church family, as the Bible says we are, then we would have exactly the same attitude of helping one another. If, can I suggest, folks, if you do want to help somebody financially in the church family, one idea might be to simply pop some money into an envelope, write their name on it, gift for Bessie Smith or whoever, pop it into the little box, the offering box at the back there, and the, the church treasurer will make sure it gets to the intended person. Okay? If you want to do that, then may I, may I, if you want to bless somebody, may I suggest that? Let's give freely. If you aren't sure if anybody is in need, then can I suggest one or two things? Number one, ask the elders if anybody is in need. Number two, spend more time with one another across the table. And in the course of the conversation, you never know what will come out. You'll find out that way. Because when we are giving... When we're giving, we're not giving to the individual. We're not giving to the work of the church. We're not giving to, an, to a missionary. You have to be very, very certain. We're giving to God, aren't we? We're giving to God. And it's an act of worship as we give. Know the joy of giving. It's marvellous. Abraham did. I hope you do. I need to come to a close now by saying that when Abraham stood before Melchizedek, he knew he was standing before somebody much greater than himself. That, that's why he gave Melchizedek the gift of a tenth of all he had. And as he gave these gifts to Melchizedek, I'm, I'm quite sure in my reading of it, I'm sure that Abraham bowed low before Melchizedek, the representative of Jesus Christ. So can I just close by asking, have you bowed down before Jesus? Have you bowed down yourself before the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you gladly acknowledged that Jesus Christ is Lord over your life? Do it while you have the chance. Because the Bible tells us that everybody one day will bow their knee before Jesus Christ, whether you like it or not. The Bible says that everybody will bow the knee. In Philippians chapter 2 it says that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. 
in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue, every last tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of Father. To the glory of God the Father. So, folks, if, if, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a Christian, and a preacher should never assume that everybody is, if you're not a Christian, then I urge you to bow your knee before King Jesus, just as as Abraham bowed before Melchizedek. Jesus is a wonderful saviour who came specifically, deliberately, to die on the cross in your place so that you don't have to. He's a wonderful saviour who loves you very much. Accept his offer of salvation today if you've never done that before. Do it and do it with a glad heart and know what it is to be a child of Almighty God, dearly loved forevermore. Amen.